group and these are the definitions that we have standardized on and agreed to in our GS1 general specification for definitions of the different packaging levels. These are really not because it's up to the manufacturer to decide if they've got a product in their hand, is it a primary package, is it a secondary package based upon how they're building out their hierarchy. The important thing is, as you build that hierarchy, you assign different g to it. Now, one of the first things I was told when I came to GS1 nine years ago, and I came strictly to work in the healthcare industry from a barcode side, was that healthcare is different from retail. It's true. The healthcare supply chain in some ways is very similar. In other ways, it's very different. The second thing I was told was that med device is different from pharma. I found out that that's true, mostly from a med device. that back in the original retail day industry. That does not apply in healthcare. You assign a G10 to a product in healthcare, and the only way you get to reuse it is if you take that product off the market and then reintroduce exactly the same product sometime farther down the road, you can resurrect that original G10. But otherwise, you assign it, it's gone. There's too many things that persist long into life that you might want to be able to track things back. And so that was the rule that came out of healthcare. And believe it or not, after about five years of healthcare having that rule, retail is now looking at it for the same reasons. They're now starting to worry about fresh foods, expiries, traceability, serialization of items. And so they're starting to actually look at healthcare. So it goes back to one of the comments that was made, I think Brian Posen made the comment about retail 40 years, Healthcare's going to end up in 10, we're going to beat retail, we're already beating retail. We're already doing things we thought about doing, at least within the GS1 system. Again, I mentioned we do have healthcare gene allocation rules. Everything I'm talking about is downloadable from the GS1 website, either in hard copy or as an interactive online program. Now, one of the first places that healthcare started to take a step ahead of retail was this need for additional information in the barcode. All retail ever worried about was the G10, that barcode that's on the water bottle in front of you. They didn't really pay attention to expiry. If they had a meat, fresh meat product in a grocery store that had an expiry date on it, someone would just physically come in, sort out the packages, take the ones that had expired, throw them away, put new ones in. Okay? That wasn't gonna work in the healthcare world. So healthcare was really the first people that started using our list of attribute information or application identifiers as we call them. And that's basically expiry, lot batch, serial number are the three that we find most of the time in healthcare. We call them application identifiers because when they're put into the barcode, they have digits that lead the actual data that tells the system that's after the scanner, this is how you parse that information out, that's how you separate it, that's how you know that this string is the expiry and this string is the lot batch. So we call them application identifiers. If you refer to a document I talk about a lot, the GS1 general specifications, it's kind of our Bible, our guide for all the GS1 standards, there's 103 application identifiers. The majority of them you're never going to see in healthcare, you're never going to have a use for in healthcare, the ones you see in front of you are the ones that are being used 98 to 99 percent of the time. Occasionally a couple of others are slipped in. What that led us to though was that the barcode that you see on the water bottle can't hold this extra information. So that brings you to a couple of other terms you've heard. The GS1128 which is the linear barcode at the top and the GS1 data matrix which is the 2D barcode at the bottom. 
They're a type of barcode language that allows you to put this extra information in. Again, here's the examples of the different application identifiers that we use in healthcare in the GS1 system. We know, the computer systems know, that if the number is 14 digits long and it starts with a 01, it's a G10. If it is up to 20 characters long, is alphanumeric, starts with a 10, it's a batch lot number, and so forth for expiry, expiry and serial number. So they're the keys that help the computer system parse the information out. Um, the question is always, why do we standardize for as few as possible? Here's the majority of the reasons. I think you've already heard some of them, those who sat in the traceability presentations yesterday afternoon, and I'm sure we'll hear it from at least one of our two speakers. One of them is Pascal, who has come into the room. Thank you, Pascal. <laughs> uh, so you will have somebody else to listen to other than me. Um, but the more data you put into a barcode, the larger it grows. What do we deal with in healthcare? Small things. We don't have a lot of space to put a barcode on. Um, it becomes increased complexity for the manufacturers to have to add more data in, especially if they have to have this set of data for this country and that set of data for another country. You suddenly end up having to have different packaging setups. You have to split out your products. You have to trace them differently. Uh, so you've got added cost, added complexity there. Um, if you have local rules and you say, well, it's for our manufacturers locally, well, if those manufacturers are exporting and your rules don't agree with the global rules, there's a challenge there. There can be cost implications. There's obviously time implications. And when we look at serialization, okay, serialization is in our terms just another application identifier when it comes to the barcode. When it comes to the barcode, you're just putting another piece of data in that barcode. When it comes to the overall system, you have all the overhead of generating the serial number, managing the serial number on both ends, putting it into the barcode and it coming out of the barcode. I can remember about eight years ago, I toured a uh, pharmaceutical facility in the UK and I asked one of the guys, what's your challenge in serializing? And we were standing next to a packaging line. He said, well, this equipment can put the serial number in the barcode and put the barcode on the package. That's no problem. And he pointed up a floor to a big glass wall with what looked like some offices behind it. He said, the problem is the serial number is going to be generated up there. It's going to be managed up there. Their systems don't talk to the system. We only use manual input down here. So even though they could print the barcode with serial number, it was only if someone was sitting at a keyboard typing it in. To do the kind of serialization that we're talking about on every secondary pack of a pharmaceutical item, I don't think we're gonna have people sitting at keyboards. We're gonna have this done electronically. So serialization conceptually is an easy thing from a barcode standpoint, from an overall system standpoint, isn't always that easy. The other thing that we run into when it comes to serialization is People like it. It's like we've heard blockchain talked about a little bit. You know, it's a, it's a good buzz term. It's, it's kind of sexy type stuff to talk about, though anybody that calls barcode sexy is either sick or related to me, one of the two. And so they want to go right to serialization instantly. They want to start out at the end. They want to run before they learn to crawl, before they learn to walk. And that's one of the things that we've had to, to do in talking to people in healthcare is say, look, let's start with the basics. Let's, let's get a G10 end thing first. Then let's get the expiry lot batch on. And then we'll put a serial number on if it makes sense, if it helps fulfill what it is that you're trying to do. In many cases, it does. In many cases, you can stop at lot batch and expiry. Okay, Craig, I am locked up again. There's a Wi-Fi switch on the side of that if you just want to shut it off. Father is looking for me. He's trying to connect to my laptop. It's bad enough I have one of the oldest laptops in the organization. I'm retiring, by the way, so everyone knows. You can ask me questions for another two months. Um, and for some reason, I said when they refreshed the laptops, oh, I don't need a new laptop. I can keep this old one. Windows 7. How many people remember Windows 7? That's what this is, okay? It does not like the rest of the GS1 world, but I work remotely, so maybe that's a good thing. Uh, one of the other keys that we have that's used quite often in uh, retail and being used quite often now in healthcare is the SSCC, the Serial Shipping Container Code. You've heard of that. 
Think of it as a serialized G10 for logistics units. So it's for the items that are, are shipping, not necessarily the item itself. So a whole pallet. Now that said, it's quite possible to have something that is both a trade item and it needs a G10 as well as a logistics unit and we need an SSCC. And for that, we have some rules. The very first rule is, if it is a logistics unit, it gets an SSCC, period, no questions asked. If it's also a trade item, you can add a G10 to it. If it changes state through the supply chain, you need to be aware of that up front so you can decide where you're going to identify which package. Again, we have whole documents that deal with the logistics side of using the SSCC. Global location number, the GLN. Actually, the expert in the GLN is sitting in the back of the room in the corner over there, and he'll be running the next session, Pete Alvarez. Um, just think of the GLN as a number for identifying locations. It's been mentioned in a couple of different presentations already. It has allocation rules, just like the SSCC does, just like the G10 does, and it has application rules. But again, it's kind of a G10 for locations or physical entities. So if you wanted to, you have a warehouse, you could take every rack and give that a GLN and then give every position on the, the rack a GLN, if you want to. You have to think through again what your process is. Craig gave me the 10 minute warning, so I'm gonna talk a lot faster than I normally do, if that's okay with everybody. No, okay. Uh, I love it. Pete is, uh, is, is actually a Cuban American, and I always thought he spoke fast until he started telling me to slow down. So I guess there's it. Yeah, wait until you get up there. So when it comes to the data carrier side, a data carrier is the term in GS1 that we use for barcodes and RFID. It's the thing that carries this data we've been talking about. It carries the G10. When you look at an RFID system, you look at a barcode system, they're very similar. Okay, you've got the, you've got the data carrier, the RFID tag or the barcode symbol. You've got something that reads it or acquires the information from it, and then you send it to a computer system. So from that standpoint, they're very similar technology. One just happens to use a visual, optical way of expressing the data in a barcode, and the other uses RFID. In healthcare, we have some very specific data needs. You know, we have to put data on small things, a lot of data on small things. We need to do it on a production line. We're not printing up 10,000 of those labels and then sticking them on the bottle later. We're putting them on the products as they're coming off the packaging line. What that's done is it's led us to the need for certain barcodes. Okay. Now, we refer to what you see up there, we being me in the AADC industry, refer to them as barcode symbologies. Think of, of them as different barcode languages. Each one of those different patterns was designed with a particular use and purpose in mind. Some carry only numbers and only fixed sets of numbers. Some can carry 4,000 letters and numbers and control characters. Those are the ones that we use in GS1, and I have to count them. There's what, let me see here, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven that we use. They're all ISO standardized barcode symbologies, barcode languages. They are seven of what is roughly now around 325 different barcode languages that exist in the world. All of them created for different uses. These are the ones we normally see, and when it comes to healthcare, it's these two, GS1 Data Matrix and GS1 128, we're starting to see more and more of because they're the ones that can hold the G10 plus the extra information. Again, the way the system works, you put it on the product, you scan it, the data goes into a computer system, the computer system does something with that data. I like to tell people that my job stops at the end of the cable that comes out of that scanner. I'm responsible of getting the number selected, getting the number in the barcode, getting the barcode on the package, getting the barcode scanned, but the data that comes out of the scanner, that's Pete's and Craig's responsibilities because that's the data sharing part of the, the puzzle. Things that you have to know fall into the categories of if you're using that linear barcode, the 128, there's a particular kind of scanner that you read that with that's been in existence since the 1970s. If you're looking at the little matrix one, that needs a different type of scanner, something that's called an imaging scanner or a camera scanner. They've actually been around in industry since the 1990s. They've just recently become two things, much more common because nobody's really making the other ones anymore unless they're very, very low end and the prices are coming down. 
It used to be up to a 10 to one difference in price. Now it's a percentage difference depending on the features that you're getting in, in the scanners. So in healthcare, one of the things that we did from the very beginning was we recognized that the 2D barcode was going to be the future. And so we started instantly five or six years ago, putting out position statements, telling people, if you're going to get new scanners, if you're going to upgrade your scanners, get camera or imager based scanners. That's where the world is going. The camera based scanner can read both. So here's a, a nice canned demonstration of what happens. Okay, the first string of data you see, that's what the data looks like going into the barcode. Okay, when the scanner scans it, that's what it looks like coming out. You can see a few differences, okay? The data going in starts out with something called a function one character. That is the character that tells the scanner that this is GS1 formatted data. When the scanner spits it out, it gives you a back bracket D2, which is an ISO standardized indicator that this is GS1 data. That's what the system uses to take the rest of the puzzle and break it into pieces and then populate the database properly. So what it tells you is you need to format the data a particular way. All the rules are in the GS1 general specification. You have to start that data with a special character. It's in the GS1 general specification. And if you get those two things right, you know the data is going to be coming out the other end properly. As long as the scanner is set up properly, and that's something that you have to tell your scanner vendor is it needs to be set up for GS1 formatted data. But I can tell you that of the small to medium to very large manufacturers of scanners, I don't know anyone who doesn't. That's the area I worked in for 35 years before coming to GS1. And we were doing that back in the 70s and the 80s because these rules were actually originally set back then. So it's out there. And if you've got a scanner that won't read a barcode, probably one of two things. One, the barcode isn't, or the scanner isn't configured properly, or two, the barcode is poor quality. Okay. And yes, mobile phones, we hear a little bit about that. A mobile phone has a little camera in it. You can use that camera with an app to scan a barcode. Okay. Um, in fact, the little camera chip that is in there is the same one that the scanner manufacturers have been using for decades now to make their handheld scanners or their fixed mount scanners, all those different ones. The difference is a mobile phone was originally designed to be a phone. The fact that you can scan barcodes with it is a nice added feature that how nice it is, is based upon who added it, who wrote the decoding software, who wrote the application, et cetera, et cetera. Scanners are designed not as mobile phones, though some do have phones in them, but it's designed to scan barcodes. And that was the group that I worked with, which was the engineers that did the image processing. And their basic philosophy was they were going to work harder and harder to scan poorer and poorer codes because that was the competitive edge. So that's really the difference between the two. And those two things have been converging. I mean, I have to admit that if I get a barcode to take a look at in my office, I use my mobile phone first. And if I have issues with it, then I switch over to the scanners that I have. So that is converging. We're going to see much more mobile phone usage. In fact, within GS1 and within the manufacturers, everyone is looking in that direction. Two minutes. So very quickly, GS1 data matrix is, again, what we're seeing primarily because you can use the GS1128 if you've got the space. If you don't, people are going to the GS1 data matrix. So they're going to that 2D barcode symbology. Okay. We have all sorts of support on that. We have a technical guideline on it. We have use case guidelines. We have these position papers I talked about, about adapting data matrix, about getting the scanners for that, about setting up your databases so they can recognize the information coming out of it. That's all available online through GS1 Global Office or through your local GS1 member organization. And this is really the last slide because this is near and dear to my heart. Is you can print barcodes all day long. They don't look good to a scanner, they're no good. So quality control of the image and the data going into it are the two most important things. Because in the end, you can have a perfectly printed barcode and it'll read all day long, but if the data's wrong going into it, then the data is never going to correct itself as it goes down the chain. It's got to be right going in. It's got to be a good printed barcode. So quality control of barcodes is something that the industry has kind of forgotten about because, well, the retail guy's been doing it for a thousand years. You know, and we know how to print barcodes. I can tell you that as generations have changed and people have done what I'm doing, retiring, et cetera, they've started to have quality issues. They started to have barcodes that 
they kind of forgot about that part of the puzzle. With that, we have information that supports the quality end. Again, a GS1 member organization can help you. We have a ton of stuff online. Just about everything is up online nowadays. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Pascal. We're gonna hold questions until the end, by the way, just to make sure we can get them all in. And besides, some of the questions you might have about the practical side, these gentlemen may answer when they talk about their experiences. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good? Excellent. So, um, what I will um, talk to you today is really um, a, a kind of lesson learned or um, what we uh, saw in the, um, with the European FMD implementation when we are talking about coding and identification of product and the different um, complexity uh, we saw when we start to implement things and when we start to, uh, to talk with the different member states. So this one is, uh, I need to show you that, so that's my lawyer. Uh, so that's typically to say that every mistake I will say, you, you can only blame me, don't blame Pfizer. <laughs> So yeah, again, um, the agenda. So after a very quick introduction about myself, uh, what I want to do is to give you the, and I guess you will be more and more familiar with the JSON standard and focus on, again, identification and barcoding. And as I said, uh, a few lessons learned, a few things, I guess it's important to take into consideration when we implement uh, traceability and when we implement serialization. Okay, but myself. Um, so I'm a member of the GS1 Healthcare Leadership Team since last year. It was a quite very interesting experience, by the way. <laughs> I'm working for Pfizer since uh, 12 years now, and I have 18 years experience in healthcare. So I work for a consultant company before uh, to join Pfizer. And um, before that, uh, also working for different um, other uh, kind of industry like petrol and oil, cosmetics. And um, I have almost, oh, no, it's, it's past, no, yeah, 11 years experience with traceability, track and trace, and supply chain or, or logistics. Okay, so capture, so the data carrier. And as uh, Chuck said, uh, so for healthcare, it's almost uh, the GS1 data matrix. And why one, and you will have the smallest footprint in your package, which is quite important industry again, because we have many, many small packs, as you may know. And it's important to be able to print this uh, small barcode with a lot of information in it. So that's really the identify and capture, so the key data element and the GS1 data matrix, what I will focus on. And when we start to, you know, to implement the, the serialization for Europe. So we started to change our artwork uh, to put the human readable information. So the, the G team, the expiry date, the, the lot number and the serial number. We also started to print the data matrix on the pack. And when we started to submit this new artwork to the regulatory body in the member states, some member states came to us and said, oh, you know, so, you are implementing this in, in that way, but we saw that uh, we want that implemented in, in the other way. And that's created a lot of confusion, a lot of complexity for the industry. And that's what I guess my, my main message would be if we can avoid that in the next implementation, that would be great. So the first one, uh, let's talk with the data matrix and the printing format of the data matrix. So if we look on the GS1 standard, you can print uh, a data matrix in different format. Square, uh, which is the most common, but you can also use the rectangular shape. And both are allowed, both are using in the exact same way. You can also print uh, the data matrix black uh, on the white um, um, background, or the other way around. You have a black background and you are printing your, your data matrix with the white dots. And again, both are allowed with the JSON standard. Both are working in the exact same way. 
But what we saw when we started to implement this is the member states said, no, 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 we want always a square that's on a white background. And we said, okay, but that's create a lot of complexity again for the industry because our printing uh, equipment, our packaging line are already equipped with something else. So what do you want from us to change everything, to uh, invest again with new equipments, et cetera, et cetera. So we said, I mean, the technology are there, the GS1 standards are there to allow everything, to allow all the options. And that's the first lesson learned. Square, rectangular, white, black, uh, 2D barcode must be accommodated and must be allowed to offer flexibility for, for the industry. Second, um, when we talk about the data to be encoded in the, in the data matrix, so I will not go back to the you know, application identifier, what, what the application identifier is working for, but the bottom line here is really to, to understand that the, the application identifier is using a, a, as a signpost to be able to retrieve all the information. So your, your data reader, your system will be able to recognize and to extract all the information independently of the order. So you can put the GTIN in the first position, you can then follow by the serial number, or you can follow by the expiry date. It's, it's no matter, I mean, it's in the, the, the system, the, the reader then the IT system will be able to retrieve the information. And again, what we started to saw, so some member states, some regulators said, no, we want the, the data in a very specific order, always the same. And that's create also complexity for us. And especially because if you are looking on the GS1 standard, what they, they told us uh, the best practices is to put all the fixed length uh, data first. So the GTIN, it's always uh, 13 or 14 digits. The expiration date, it's always six digits. And doing that, uh, you will not be able or you will not be obliged to put what we call the separators in, in your data to be encoded. And at the end, you will free um, the space of the data encoded and less data you encode, uh, smaller will be your data matrix. So that's why we want to have the flexibility to get to encode the information in any order we want. So that's the second lesson learned. No specific order should be mandated. So this should be also let at the discretion of the manufacturers of the marketing authorization order, again, for flexibility. The next one is um, quite uh, tricky, I would say. So again, the, the usage of the application identifier, we know we talk about the, its use for the data encoded, but what the GS1 standard and what the best practices uh, told us is um, you have also to print this application identifier in the human readable format, any reason. So the end user, when he wants to scan, to scan, so he will use this human readable information to retrieve each element. And he will be able to make the link between the application identifier and the variable data. So he can use it in, in, in the process um, after that. But we know also that regulation allow or obliged us uh, to put uh, a prompt, fixed prompt, and I will try to, okay. So like uh, SN for serial number or EXP for the expiration date. And the example you see here on the screen. So if we have large box, it's not an issue. We can put both. We can put EXP and then after the application identifier. But if you have small box, again, you are facing a physical space issue. You, are not, you don't have the space at all to put all the information. And the GS1 standard hopefully also allow us uh, in this very specific issue, if we have a space issue, to not print the application identifier and print only the regulatory prompt that the, the legislation just to put on, on, the, on the back. And again, what we saw, uh, it's sometimes the, the regulator said, no, no, we want both, et cetera, et cetera. Again, uh, introducing complexity, introducing a lot of questions. Should we increase the size of the packs with all the consequences? So you 
you increase the size of your packs, you can put less uh, box uh, or carton in your shipper case, so you have more shipper case, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you increase your logistic cost. So lesson learned here. Application identifier in the human readable text should be again at the discretion of the marketing authorization holder or the manufacturers. As long as uh, we are following the rules, we are following the JSON standard and uh, we are in compliance with that. So that's the bottom line, but we should have again the flexibility. Okay, so um, next one is the transition period for implementation. Imagine, so you are putting a legislation in place that, uh, that will uh, oblige you to put a data matrix. But you have in the past a 1D barcode, a linear barcode. So what um, we saw also in, in EU again, so that the regulator said, as soon as you are putting your data matrix, you should remove your 1D barcode. You cannot have two barcode in, in the same time on the same pack. Fine, okay, so we can do that as a manufacturer, so it's just a question of managing the artwork update. But what happened for the rest of the stakeholders in the logistic or in the supply chain? That means if, that's the example of Europe, by the way. So the, the FMD will be applicable from the 9th of February next year. That means the 10th of February, all the packs in the market will have only a data matrix. Not anymore, one day. And if all the stakeholders, the wholesalers, the distributors, but more important, the hospitals and the, the pharmacies are not able to read the data matrix, what will happen? So very difficult situation sometimes. That's why we, we should have a, a transition period allowed. We should be flexible again, put both barcodes in the, in the same time, and for sure, the manufacturers will remove the 1D in a certain uh, point of time in, in the future, but we should have this transition period. That's really the, the, the key message here. Transition period should be allowed. Last but not least, um, again, about the human readable information. Here is a couple of examples where, uh, again, based on the size of the pack, we are able to put all the information in one way, so all um, above the others or, or below the others. And most important, we are um, um, allow or we can uh, put the prompt and the variable data in the same line, which is the perfect situation. But sometimes, because the pack size uh, is very small, we should accommodate this situation. So we should be able to put the prompt in one line and then uh, print the variable data um, below this one line prompt. And again, this should be allowed uh, to avoid any uh, specific situation for the manufacturer that they will again have to increase the size of the pack and in, with all the consequences again. And the bottom line here is the rules for the manufacturers again is we should allow these situations as long as the readability of the information is not affected. So that means for the end user, it should be able to recognize, okay, here the first is the PC, the product code. The first variable data should be the product code, you know? And with this easy way, you are able to, to recognize and, and to retrieve your information very easily. So that's really the rule, the basic rules, but except that flexibility should be allowed again. And I think that that was the last lesson learned. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. And our next feature, yeah, speaker will be Ulf Zurich from Abbott. Ulf? Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I know it's a little bit hot inside here, but we still hope that this will go away soon and we get better temperature. Um, so first of all, um, thank you very much for giving me the, the opportunity to talk here. Um, and you heard a little bit from Chuck about the general standards and then from Pascal about the implementations and, and uh, what are the challenges and what it means to apply standards in that sense. <clears throat> I want to bring it a little bit more also in the broader scope. 
Um, Abbott has a unique uh, position here, uh, and I will tell you in a minute uh, what that is, but also what we observed in the different implementations from a data perspective, what needs to be um, taken into uh, consideration. First, a little bit about Abbott. We have um, four different um, divisions. We have nutrition, we have diagnostics, we have the medical devices, and uh, the medicines. Um, from that perspective, um, we have multiple options where we run into uh, GS1 and, and uh, serialization. Um, also, Abbott has been transformed the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, first of all, with the separation of AbbVie, uh, with the proprietary pharma business. We own, an, at Abbott, owning the um, uh, brand generics business. Um, but we had a huge shift into emerging markets from a sales perspective. As you can see, 42% uh, is now in emerging market. And if we now dig into pharma, and that's my unique point here, this is our pharmaceutical market at Abbott Laboratories. We have no business in the developed markets. If nothing in the US, nothing in Canada, nothing in Europe, nothing in Australia, nothing in Japan, we're just in the emerging markets. So from that perspective, we have, of course, also a completely different driver and looking into things in a completely different way than I would say our, our rich partners uh, are doing. Uh, we have not that high price products. So we always look into from an implementation perspective, how we can do it most efficient. And that's not easy, you know, if, if we see for, for some of the countries where we have own manufacturing and then have to compete um, uh, with the local manufacturers uh, in, in a specific way, uh, for a big corporations, it's always difficult. But what does the implementation really mean to us in that sense? So back again, education, 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 I know. But it's just only that the information stuck. So if we talk about implementation of finally track and trace, there are the stages we have to follow through. And it's not because of us manufacturers. It's because of the regulators, the situations in the countries, the capabilities of your in-country supply chain down to the pharmacies, down to the hospitals to capture the data. So baby steps, it Chuck said, you know, don't start to run before you know how to crawl. So it is important first to understand what the implementation of standards means. So we start with dynamic coding. It's the G10, it's the batch number, it's expiry. That's it. Let, let us implement this. Let's see that every partner can work with that before we go to the next one, which is the serialization piece, which gives an additional complexity. Um, and here it's mainly also in country to receive the information, but also from the local manufacturer to just apply it because technology is completely different in that sense. Uh, you need a much higher level of automation. And I know in, in, in your countries, you do a lot of things still manually that can't apply. And the final part is then track and trace. And then the, the magic comes where we know exactly where the goods are, but with that, we create also a lot of data and that data needs to be processed on every level. And that's also what we have to have in mind. So just look into this one. This is a, a typical example of um, how to generate data. So we have a product, um, you produce a, a vast majority of, of products, 125 million, which is not too much in that sense from a global perspective. You put 24 in a case um, and then um, you, you put um, 100 cases on a pallet and you put all your serialized numbers in and you want to track and everything around this. So you generate over 12 years, more or less over 7,000, 8,000 terabyte on data. That data needs to be stored, the data needs to be processed. 
that data needs to be exchanged. So the whole IT infrastructure in the country, and it's, it's independent if we talk about wire or if we talk about mobile, but the capacity needs to be there. So if you run into this, also what I said earlier in the, in the steps, always define yourself, where, where is my end game? Try to define the roadmap, like Hiram this morning very well uh, described, where Ethiopia want to be in 2025. Make a roadmap and then with them looking into this. And the question, what do you see? You remember from yesterday, I'm almost close to the APEC uh, toolkit, which had been, had been developed. So take this also as an implementation guideline. It guides you through your country implementation. So <clears throat> three different parts more on the data side. Um, data integrity. It's really important that, that you understand what global standards mean. How much time I have left, Chuck? I'm seeing you getting nervous on the, on the watch. Okay, good. <laughs> 15 minutes. Oh, I can do it less. So we have more time for questions. Um, so um, it's really understanding this, the standards and then going into defining the technical specifications. We have countries which just issue, we want to have a serialization implemented by da da da. Against what? We need, we need that what? We need the specification. So have that in mind if you didn't do this. But Skal gave some very good hints in how to apply this in that sense. Use the standards, use black and white uh, possibilities, do different possibilities and how that could be applied on the pack. Um, so all this is important. And then also uh, it's very important that, that you understand <clears throat> the information and what it means for a data exchange from a manufacturer to a distributor to a wholesaler to a pharmacy to a hospital pharmacy to a donor down to the patient. If you really want to have the benefit of track and trace, and the only thing what we, why we want to do this is for patient safety. So then we have to take into consideration what that does that really mean from the information processing point, and what kind of data needs really to be in line with each other. You heard a couple of times of master data. That is the key. In the definition, if you start your roadmap, that's the first thing you have to, to think about. And also build expertise in barcodes. We have countries try to sell us as manufacturer that here at the left barcode is a 2D code. I said, uh, no, it's, it's, yes, it's not a linear barcode, so that's good, half right, but it's a QR code. And the other thing is a 2D matrix code. You can store information much better, much more readable um, in a 2D matrix code than on, on a QR code. The QR code you could put somewhere else to make a link to a website works perfectly, but not for GS1 data. Even if, it could, if you could do, but uh, in, in general, uh, you should not do. It's all about this, this, the, 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 the status and ha have that understanding in what the data really means. The second is data security. I talked about already that amount of data uh, which is being, being processed and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, sent across the different partners. But even if you have that in mind, you know, we do this, we implement track and trace because we want to secure the product, the product we manufacture, which we send over into your countries, and we hope that it will reach the patients. It's our interest, especially, I don't know, my, my company's uh, uh, interest as well for the other manufacturers is the same. You know, our credo is life to the fullest. We really mean this. We really want to bring healthcare and better life to all our, our patients. 
So if we want to, to do this, we also need to ensure that the data security is being set from the beginning. So if you, if you do your government database, think about data security in that sense. One of the things, and we're in discussions and a little bit later in the, in the, in the second panel, I'll come to, um, back to that. China, Ulrike said that also earlier, where you first have to go to a distribution point to get your serial numbers. That's the first pos possible bridge point you can have. So always take that into consideration. If you do from a data security perspective, it's always important because if somebody's getting the the, the serial as number, that person, that company could really bring wrongly coded products into the supply chain, and that's what we don't want. So authentication, authorization, also quite interested. Uh, we had a couple of uh, presentations about data sharing. Yeah, that's important. From a manufacturer perspective, we are not that keen on the data sharing, you know, volumes, prices, there is always something where, ah, no, we don't like it so much for good and for bad reasons, I, I, I have to admit. But in the end, we have countries where if you have a login to the government database, you can see everybody else's serial number that they issued. That's an issue. For me, it's an issue. For us, it's an issue. And then also for the data and change and data sources, as I said, you process data. You need to have the infrastructure right. One of our plans where we start now, 50% uh, of the manufacturing buildings have no access to our internal uh, network. So we start the project by, you know, buying wire and Wi-Fi wi routers and bring it into our manufacturing uh, uh, plants. So that's all what you have to, to take into that. And then the data security, no, nobody can get into this. And then... The final point uh, on this one is really the data modeling and reporting. Now, now we're talking about the, the high end, and now it's also why it's important to have that from the beginning, that you really do this, um, you understand in your governing reporting as well, what is dynamic data and what is static data. Dynamic data is that what we want to have in. It's it's the serialized number, it's the lot number, it's the expired date, and we have one link that's a G10. That fixes it into all the other information you could have. If you want to have in your country, in addition, country of origin, prices, HS codes, whatever you want, you can have it, but please don't request that to encode it into the code. Keep it into, into your data model on your, your backend database. Also, it should be scalable. Brian told this morning about, you know, just doing things in Tanzania with uh, vaccines, five manufacturers. Um, I think it was very optimistic, uh, just saying, you know, we can implement it for the whole um, uh, pharmaceutical sector within two years. If the systems are not scalable, no way. And scalable does not mean, okay, I, I, I buy uh, three different more circuits and, and service and plug that in. It's really traffic perspective. You have to take that into, uh, um, into consideration. You have to have the design for, for the, the big data piece. So challenges, um, equipment is also not able to print all the codes. Um, also, that if you do implementation, especially the address for for local manufacturers in that sense, you have to have that in, in, in mind. Um, additional information is difficult to print. Normally, today's print has can maximum print in in five different lines. If you again want to have prices and other information on that pack. You have to buy a second printer head on that line. Uh, you reduce your line speed, your efficiency goes, goes down, your costs are going up. Um, so all these kind of implementation perspectives have that in mind as well if you go into this. I know it's important you need that information, but have that in mind, please. Um, 
we'll find solutions if if needed but um you know if we can meet halfway that's good upstream compl uh, um, complications also um as we have also external manufacturer who produce for specific technology for us, we have to bring them in as well. So if you import um, also from, from other parts or within the countries, you have different uh, companies uh, producing for yourself, uh, you know, you have to embed that also. You, know, you have to ensure that you, you can give them your CLS number and they, they give you back the, the numbers. Um, and then the centralized distribution of serial numbers, I, I already said that, you know, keep it as central as possible to the manufacturers. Uh, if you do this and spread it out, then it's, uh, it, it may get messy. So global standards are, are the key success sex factor for serialization traceability. Uh, it is really important. Um, the pick is one of our company pictures uh, for our theme, um, life to the fullest. It's not fitting to the continent. Yes, I get it, but nevertheless, it should just express that where we want to go to from an added perspective. Um, there's a lot of things around the supply chain where we are looking forward for an implementation of a solid um, uh, serialization and traceability system under GS1 standards. Um, and uh, we are more than happy to help you in setting these up. And I think by with this, I give it back to you for Q&A, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now have some time for questions and answers, and while you're thinking of those, you'll notice that on the board, I've spotlighted two of the Q&A sessions tomorrow afternoon again. If you're too shy today, um, Find us in the hallway, find us at the networking event tonight, uh, find us tomorrow during the Q&A sessions in the afternoon. Um, with that, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Greg, Greg, can you get a mic over there? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Laxon. Jamba, my name is from Zambia. Uh, during the presentation, I think all the three presentations, is something about the format of the dates that is followed. And I thought I picked a day, month, and year. But I think for the examples that I was seeing, it looked like only a month and a year was picked. So maybe just some clarification on that. Then the other one is just some details on the, the difference between QR and 2D. Yes, 2D. Yeah. Um, to add a perspective to that, the question about QR and 2D, maybe the difference, because yeah. I did learn that there are two different systems, yeah. which then for me speaks that we do need different systems to scan. What is scanning the QR yeah. and the 2D? Yeah. Now, in the emerging market with the limitation in resources, would that mean maybe having multiple... Um, systems for scanning for an institution that may be managing different commodities that may come with uh, different uh, courts. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I congratulate you for thinking that I can remember three questions. Uh, I'm old and my mind's a little slow, but I think I've got them all. Um, first, uh, we, we look at the date formats in two different ways. It always goes into the barcode exactly the same way, year, year, month, month, day, day. Always. So the way it is encoded, the way it's put into the barcode, it's always that structure. The way it's shown in the human readable, um, the way it comes out is always the same, but the way it's shown in the human readable can be dictated by a regulator. Um, it could be based upon your existing systems, and I'm watching my two manufacturing friends over here shaking their heads yes. Uh, so there's, there's many different ways of, of showing it in the human readable. But it always goes into the barcodes the same way and always comes out the same way. So that's one. Um, just I'll try to throw all the QR data matrix stuff together because I can tell you folks, the ones that are still awake, this is where we get into my world. Okay. From the very top, from a purely technical standpoint, the only difference between QR and data matrix 
is the way the information is graphically encoded. In other words, how it looks in those patterns. They technically have the same capacity. They technically have the same um, character sets. They technically have the same capabilities. They're both technically 2D barcode symbols. One of my pet peeves that I will take to my grave is how people describe those things because the proper names are QR code and data matrix. They are both 2D matrix symbologies. Okay. They could be used interchangeably in most markets. So the question is, why do we see data matrix in healthcare more than we do QR code? And it comes down to more the application aspects of it. Many more applications have been built around QR code for the marketing world, for putting URLs into a barcode. And so many more applications exist for that from a marketing presence. Data matrix was adapted more in the industrial area. When we look at it from a GS1 healthcare standpoint, when we first started promoting 2D use 10 years ago, our members, and we're a member-driven organization, they tell us which way to go, our members said, we want to center on one type of matrix barcode symbology because we don't want to have mixed you know, artwork. We don't want to have mixed training. A lot of them were already printing data matrix for different reasons. They didn't want to have to teach people this other barcode, even though technically they could do the same thing because they look different, because they're used for different purposes usually, they didn't want to veer from that. So from a pure technical standpoint, they're interchangeable, I'll admit that. From an application standpoint, again, focusing in on one global way of doing something and being able to say to people, if you've got a small item, you've got a lot of information, put it in a data matrix barcode. They don't have to worry about that. Now the flip side of your question was the scanning side and the handling of the data. Again, I come from the scanning world, trust me, right? I look like a, a reasonable individual, so trust me, the scanners don't care. The only thing that makes the scanners care is if it's been configured to ignore one of the other barcodes. Why would somebody do that? I mean, I can remember back in the 80s, we had a scanner that would read 50 different types of barcode symbologies, 50 different barcode languages. We would turn 48 of those off. Why? Because then the scanner doesn't have to decide what it's looking at. It only has to make a choice between two. It doesn't have to make a choice between 50. It saves time. How much time? Back then, a lot, because processing speeds were slower. Software wasn't necessarily as aggressive as it is today. Okay? Today, they all run the same. It's a lot like, I love it when someone says, you can't read data matrix with a mobile phone. Well, if you don't have the right app, you're not going to. But there's nothing inherent in the mobile phone that says it can read one, it can read the other. It's the application that's in there. It's, is that language turned on or turned off? So I hope that answered your questions. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> one over here, sir. By the way, while the microphone's going over there, remember that we have a networking event tonight. We're going to a, uh, whoops. We also have a coffee break after this. <laughs> but networking event tonight, the buses are gonna start departing at 7 p.m. Oh, and don't forget to fill out the uh, survey forms that are on the tables. If you don't have a survey form and you want to fill it out, I can do it for you. Just put your name on it, hand it to me, we'll take care of it. But they are around on the tables. If you need one, let us know. Sir. Sure. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm Bashir from South Africa. And I think the question, it, it might not be directly related to what has just been spoken about, but I guess it's just a general question. If I was acting on behalf of a Department of Health, and I put tenders out. So for example, Pfizer and Abbott decides to go for that tender. One thing that I will want to work towards is getting the demand and supply right. So for example, if we have unique coding for Pfizer and for Abbott, does it have some sort of, do we have a capability to be able to talk parent and child? So if it's the same product, let's say it's paracetamol, Abbott and Pfizer tendered for it, uh, they got it awarded, and then being able to aggregate that information up and down for demand and supply work. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to get an indication of that. 
And then the second question related to that is, now paracetamol gets discontinued for that condition, something new comes in, so it's almost like supersession. So how do we then take that demand data from the previous product to put it onto the new one? And it might not be a GS1 type question, but I just like to understand how do we get that parent-child thing right? <laughs> because if I'm from a department of health, I need to understand demand from a country perspective, not from a Pfizer or App perspective. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say two things. Remember the part of my presentation about once it comes out of the cable, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> I'm not the one to be standing up here right now talking about that because that really is more of a data and business related question. But I think Ofer is going to, uh, yeah. going to comment. Yeah, no, so, so sorry, it, it wasn't yeah. too, it's just, yeah, I, I would just like to know that if, if anyone does have any so, understanding of that. So, so the first differentiation for paracetamol 500 milligram from Pfizer and from us would be Pascal would have one GTA number and I would have one GTA number. So from that perspective, from an aggregation perspective, what you want to have in country for the tender will not work. Because it is once who is ever awarded, and, and there could be Rush as well, and Ciplar, and Mylan, and Teva, did I forget? Yeah, a million of others. So whoever is getting awarded has their own G10. So that makes you from a, from a donor and in-country supply chain uh, perspective, it, it makes much more difficult. I, I, I do agree that's, that's difficult, but that's the only way that we also can separate our data from each other because, you know, the amount of Pfizer and Rush and Abbott and everybody is, is uh, producing we are quickly, within a year, run out of the 20 characters for the serialized number. So we need the G10 as differentiator. That's the only way uh, how we, yeah. we can work. Yeah. I understand the, the difficulty on, on your side, but it's a little what we can do on our side. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just maybe a general question. Then Is there almost like a layer of master data that's in missing that we can almost aggregate up for any national department to say that? Because they need to understand things from A, holistic perspective. We understand it that you need to ag disaggregate down for payments and for having unique g tens with various suppliers, but is there then a possibility of aggregating a level up and getting master data on that layer at that product level, be it paracetamol 500? I don't know, um, I'm just asking. Just, just a quick comment on this. Um, this is where a supply chain driven um, identification system and the point of care system come together. And um, the way to resolve that is at, at, at the receiving side. So let's judge whether it's a hospital, a clinic, doctor's office, a distribution center, um, is to, the next session that we're gonna talk about in about 45 minutes or so, data sharing and data synchronization comes in. This is where the, the other piece of the puzzle gets resolved. So I'm from GS1 South Africa. I want to just share that there's a whole team on collaborating forecasting. Within the healthcare sector, what they're going to do for South Africa, we're going to use the GDS in space, but you're going to have product classification. And you can do forecasting at the lower level, but also at the aggregated level from a, a categorization. It's not, you still have individual details, you need that. But when you aggregate it and classify it or categorize like category management in the retail space, you're going to be able to continue. And you'll be able to sort out all your supersession uh, questions when you do linkaging. But that is all the process that goes on the part that Chuck says that's out the computer, outside of the GS1. So you need to think process down, down the uh, supply chain visibility side that goes beyond the master data, but aggregating data to do transactional forecasting. But we'll, we'll help. Um, I, I know we're going to be working with the Department of Health uh, in South Africa to. to to, to actually share how we categorize data. It's not necessarily aggregation, it's categorization of data to classify so we can forecast at a higher level and then disaggregate to a lower level. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Um, just one comment on that. So uh, that, uh, there was a new term there that we haven't heard yesterday or today, which is classification. Uh, and does everyone know what a classification system is? Okay, classification is a way of grouping things. 
Um, what it does, it says that, for instance, one of the most widely used classification systems in the world is UNSPSC. There are many. In healthcare, there are about 21. Um, what it does, it says that if a particular product that has a classification code belongs to a certain category, a certain family, it does not mean that two products that have the same classification codes to drugs are exactly the same drugs. It means that they fall in a certain category. It does help resolve uh, a magnitude of variety of different GTINs that you might have from different suppliers into smaller groups so you can do the better mapping. So that's a very good point. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Geraldine, and, and thanks. The, I, and I'm sorry to bring this up. It's just the, uh, this is just the last point that I have. It's just, um, I would like to keep it practical because, you know, this is like the real challenges that I experience on a daily basis. So if we get that right, it will help, hopefully, in a lot of the other countries that might have similar type challenges. And another challenge that we do have is also, it comes specifically down to supply and demand planning, where, for example, let's say, let's keep with the paracetamol example. It's a 500 milligram. It's out of stock. We now use the 250 milligram and we double up on that. And then that creates phantom demand and we end up stocking, overstocking on that and then the other one comes back and then we try and bring that one up and then the supplier goes and produces more and it just causes the full on bulwark effect, right? So these are just the practical things that we experience on a daily basis. And I just like us to keep that to the back of our mind that when we implement, and it's not GS1 to fix, it's collectively that we got to look at it all the way from source down to the patient and how the practical challenges that we have every day, how this will hopefully help with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, it is time for the coffee break right now. The one thing that I wanted to mention that I forgot to mention earlier really came up right here, which is your first point of contact for information is the local GS1 member organization in the country that you're in. Okay? If your country doesn't have an MO, you contact global office and the global office will help you get the information you need. But it's knowledgeable people like this in country that we have in our different member organizations that can help you answer your questions. And with that, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. I believe we're right on time for coffee break, right? My, my boss says it's coffee break time. It's coffee break time. <laughs> <laughs> practical things that we experience on a daily basis and I just like us to keep that to the back of our mind that when we implement and it's not GS1 to fix it's collectively that we got to look at it all the way from so
uh, their view of this. So we're really grateful that they're here. Uh, and I'm going to start. So the first question is, master data has been brought up a few times yesterday and today, but I haven't heard the question. And I need you to raise your hands for this one because I'm not leaving the room until you do. <laughs> Does everyone know what we mean by master data? <laughs> not a facetious question. Does everyone know what we mean by, by master data? Okay. He did because Dominic over here works for Lanza and they are a phenomenal PIM company with uh, a lot of experience in master data. Master data, and it was covered briefly in the previous session. What it means um, is information that describes, uh, defines a product, an object, a person. Our specific use of this term has everything to do with product information, and it is the static information. Things like description, size, weight, ingredient, active ingredient, route administration, these things that are consistent about a product regardless of where it's produced and which batch it was produced within. Things like serial number, lot batch, expiry, things that change frequently is called dynamic data. That data is not synchronized via uh, any network, to be honest, that, that, that's a high volume capacity data. The problem with master data is starts here. And I recognize that not everyone has a database, but every company that manufactures a product has information about that product. And they have it usually in a database, sometimes multiple databases, sometimes multiple databases all over the planet, particularly for the multinational manufacturers. Their customers, whether it's a distributor, a hospital, pharmacy, whoever their customer is, has information about the product. And regardless of how that information is shared between the manufacturer and their customer, sooner or later, something's gonna change on either side. Either because I saw the description, didn't like it, that's not the way I write it, so I changed it, or something like that, and that's when the pipe breaks. And that's what causes the master data problem that everybody struggles with. Um, there's a data quality component to this, which we'll talk about as well. Here's something else that makes this problem a lot more complicated. I said a second ago that for the multinational manufacturers, they have multiple operations all over the planet with multiple computer systems, ERPs, enterprise resource planning systems. Over the years, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a black and white picture. That's a mainframe room, and I'm old enough to remember those. Over the years, over the past 40 years, as uh, local area networks in the 80s and 90s came into play, then most recently in the past 10 years or so, uh, cloud environments and most, most recently mobile phones. Um, as the progression of technology changed, it made that problem of knowing where your data is and how you access it that much more difficult. All of the bullets in between, I'm not gonna read all of them for the sake of time, but I wanna point a couple of things here. Most often, the process between the business process, the process by which you produce something, and, and gather the information about the product. And the information about it is broken, it's not connected. It's a bullet in between. The last one, um, data quality starts with the other source. And I can't emphasize this enough. If you're the manufacturer of the product, you have a responsibility, as these two gentlemen will tell you, about establishing data quality and maintaining it. And if you're the distributor, you have an equal responsibility for maintaining data quality. We have, as GS1, a whole host of standards and programs and best practices around maintaining data quality. This is a slide from one of the manufacturers, actually. So I, I didn't create this. And the point here is that most, um, as, as more demand for information uh, becomes prevalent all over, all over the world, uh, manufacturers are being bombarded with a lot of requests for a lot of information. So these questions, so where do we start? How do we define success? Are we in compliance? That, that's a big one. So it, what we try to do as an organization is provide some guidance and provide some use cases so that we know whether we're talking about procurement versus distribution, logistics, bedside scanning, those type of things. But um, manufacturers have a challenge unless there is some structured way of addressing master data. Hospitals or a pharmacy or even a regulator uh, Data comes into to these organizations via one of these means. Printed data, a spreadsheet maybe, 
manual data entry is very common. And if you remember for a minute that every 300 keystrokes, there's a data error or an error made, do the math. You can see the number of problems you start to run into. The diagram on the right is a hospital from the United States that's in the process of implementing the Global Data Synchronization Network, GDSN. And if you are able to see that, um, you will see that there's a multitude of places inside the hospital where there's data about a product or obviously patients. The question that becomes, how did that data get there? And is that data the same as the data the manufacturer created? So you can start to see the magnitude of problems that you already know about. Uh, I think most regulators are in the room next door. Are any regulators here? No? Okay. So let me ask this, any manufacturers? Couple. Distributors, hospitals, couple. Who are the rest of you guys? <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I work in GDS and I need humor. Um, uh, regulators have responsibility to ensure the highest level of market surveillance, not only in the countries in which they provide regulation for, but across borders, and particularly in this continent is an issue that you're very familiar with, because we have countries that, that, are, that are trapped within other countries. So cross-border uh, commerce and, and regulation that's complementary becomes critical. So um, the, here's some of the challenges that they run into. I want to get to this, though. Uh, enough of the problems. This is, this is really what, what we need in place to solve this data problem. On the supplier side, they need a single point of entry. They need to be able to gather all this data inside their company and through one connection, send it out to all of their customers. That's the ideal situation. It has to be secure because you want to make sure that the right person is getting the right information intended for them and not for somebody else. Standards-based so that what you do can be replicated over and over and over again. That, that, makes, that increases efficiency and decreases cost. As a hospital, regulator, pharmacy, whoever you are on the customer side, on the receiving side of this relationship, you want a single point of truth, however that is. You want to know there's a place where you can get that data, you can trust it because it's accurate, correct, complete, and accurate. Standards-based so that regardless of how many suppliers you're dealing with, they're behaving the same way. They're identifying products the same way and providing data to you in a, in a, in a common way, in a consistent way. Here we're going to dive now a little bit into, into data quality. And, and to be frank, uh, data quality is a complex subject of its own, and I only have two slides to it. But I want at least to highlight it, because even if you're using something as sophisticated as the GDSN, unless there's a data quality program on the front end, on the, whoever's putting data into the pipeline, all you can do is share bad data faster. And bad data is worse than no data, because you rely on bad data then. So we urge every data source, a manufacturer, distributor, whoever is originating that data, to have a data governance program in place. These are the policies and procedures. Who is responsible for creating the data? Who's responsible for auditing it? And who approves it before you let it out of your company? Roles and responsibilities means that if you have 10 different departments in the process of information creation and sharing, What's my role and what's yours? If you're the one that's responsible for approving it, do you, have, do you have the ability to see it? If I'm the one creating it, do I have the ability to do that? So there's a whole host of things to know about that. Enterprise-wide data management is you often, when you think of master data management, you hear of systems like SAP, IBM, Oracle, Lancet sitting over there, others. That's, that's the software application. Uh, that's what drives the enterprise-wide system for managing information. Data quality is the last point. If you have the first three in place, then this is where you put the validations and verifications. Is the information correct? And is it um, accurate? And is it complete? It can be accurate. Is that dinner? Yeah. <laughs> it can be accurate, but can still be wrong because it's not the correct data, right? You have measurements that are, that are accurate, but it's just wrong still. So it's a lot that goes into that. Lastly, the quality of the information is a reflection of the quality of the product. Do any of you shop online? Any products, a couple? And when you <laughs> shop online and you're looking for an image or a shirt or shoe or whatever you're buying, if it's not there, you're more likely not gonna buy it from that site. <laughs> so um, 
does it, and, and in, in the pharmaceuticals, it's, it doesn't change. Here's where this gets interesting for the manufacturers. Uh, and again, this is a whole entire program that we do training, so I wanted just to make you aware of it. But this is called an information life cycle model. This uh, are the key steps that as the data source, as the manufacturer or distributor, you have to go through. You create the data, you enrich it, meaning you complete it. So wherever you, sometimes the data comes from upstream from your um, ingredient suppliers. And then you enrich it, you activate it, it means that at a certain point in time, you, you're starting to activate it within your own internal systems. Auditing is a function of, of uh, people using it and, and, and grading it. Update is when something changes uh, that you, you have to go back and, and update that data and then share it with those that you, you shared it with previously. Archiving uh, is different than purging. Archiving is maybe data for a product that's been uh, it's no longer produced, but you need to still retain it. Purging is what it is, just it's no longer used, it's no longer needed. So this is a whole entire life cycle that manufacturers go through, um, and there are many. This is just one representation of, of that. A couple of things, and I know, can, I know you can't read this, but you'll get the slides. And so uh, what this is intended to do is to say that all of the actors in the supply chain and the accompanying information supply chain have a responsibility. Manufacturers need to know the intended purpose of the data. What is my customer trying to do in their process so that I make sure that I give them the correct information and the correct quantity of information that they need. Take steps to improve data quality. Distributors in between, distributors are the link often between whoever makes the product and you that's buying it. They have a similar possibility as manufacturers plus one more. They have to maintain the integrity of the data that they get from the supplier, from the manufacturer, and add, uh, make sure that the quality of the information that they add to the product or the process is also the same level. Solution providers are often forgotten. And solution providers are the key that enables the GS1 system. Without solution providers, it doesn't really work because it's just documents with specifications. And uh, they are the link between the hardware and software that you buy and when they bake in our standards, that's what enables you to, to do what you are intending to do. Lastly, the data recipients means uh, hospitals, pharmacies, regulators, whoever the last point is. Um, and they have a need to, to the, when, when you know the data is being used across the entire supply chain is when those that are buying include in our world just one standards in their orders and those that are shipping in their invoices. That's when you know that everybody's integrating it. That's a hard point to get to, but this, these are just the high level levels of responsibility. And uh, there's more to this, but, but uh, you'll get the slides. I just want at least to, to try to separate the responsibilities of the different actors. This now is the data synchronization network. My task was to explain this in a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, this can take a while, but let me put it this way. GDSN is a standard and a system of interoperable solution providers that are called data pools. There are 37 in the network operating all over the world right now. They're certified to be compliant with our standards by a third party agency. So we don't certify them because that would be cheating. Somebody else does. And they ensure that they are consistent with each other and they're able to interoperate regardless of the te technology in which their solutions are built. At the core of GDSN is something that GS1 owns and operates it is the global registry. The global registry can only be accessed through one of these certified data pools. It has very little data in it by design. It knows who the manufacturer is by the global location number, the GLN. It knows the product by the GTIN. It knows the target market in which those products are authorized to be sold in. And it has a classification code indicating whether it's a drug or a device. And it's all that's there. The rest of the data is between the manufacturer and their customer. And that's shared across the network between the data pool that represents the, uh, the source of the data and the data pool that represents the receiver of the, of the data. Any one of the 37 data pools, in fact, every one of the 37 data pools has to be able to perform both roles. Because often that data synchronization is happening within one solution provider, but it also happens across the network, from Australia to South Africa to Canada and beyond. Um, 
There are two ways to share information. If I'm a manufacturer, and I, and I know all of you, you are my customers, and you're all part of the network, and I know your GLN number that identifies you in the, in the network, I can send your data directly. And you get a notification from the network that says, there's data here for you. And then you have the opportunity to review it, accept it, reject it, question it. The other way around is that you're the customer on the manufacturer. You know my GLN, you can request my data. You can request all of my data or certain data. You can subscribe by the GLN number and say, I wanna know everything that this company has published. And they get, a, they get a request and they probably have a relationship with them to determine whether they give you the whole truckload or whatever you need to have. That's a simplification of how the network works. And this is what's being used, uh, what is intended to be used here. There, there are <clears throat> um, 47,000 organizations, 27 million GTINs, about 2.5 million healthcare GTINs. Most of those are devices. So the pharmaceutical industry has a bit to catch up, but it is happening now. There's an interest now. Pharmaceutical companies have been focused over the past 10 years on traceability. Traceability requires master data. So as it's becoming more and more common, then the use of GDSM becomes more and more common. That was it in a nutshell. I hope that was useful. And I'm gonna turn over to my younger brother, Craig, to uh, tell you about the traceability part. Thank you. Separated at birth. I'm Craig from Global Office. Uh, I've been working with EPCIS for the past 10 years now. Um, I'm also the general editor of the EPCIS technical standard. And for the past three years, I'm the editor of the uh, misleadingly named tag data standard, which is not just related to RFID. It's, uh, it's also very important for using EPCIS. And um, no appearances can be deceiving, but I'm also a member of the, the, the healthcare team at GS1 Global Office. I apologize for the very wide voice. It's been a, a rough week on, uh, on my upper respiratory tract. How many people in the room think that they could give me uh, a 30 second elevator pitch about what EPCIS does? <laughs> so you, can, you, can, you can tell he's my brother. Um, how many people in the room could give me a 30 second elevator pitch about blockchain? Okay, I guess it's not really a fair question because I don't think it's possible to give a 30 second elevator pitch about either and do either of them justice. But um, blockchain is a topic which has gotten become more and more sexy and more and more hyped over the past couple of years. You can usually gauge that by the frequency with which mails or phone calls come into your office from the C level asking what are we doing with topic X, Y, Z. Most of the excitement around blockchain um, centered on the fact that for the first time, companies are talking about exchanging data beyond their four walls with their trading partners, about their product movements, about what's really happening in their supply chain. And this is, this is a kind of a, a new concept in the supply chain. Companies generally don't exchange this, haven't exchanged this kind of information up until now. They've been relatively good at sending things like dispatch advices that something might be on the way or electronic invoicing but actual product movement information has, this is relatively new. And, uh, and this is why there's so much excitement about blockchain. And in fact, this is what EPCIS already enables. And it's, I think most would agree blockchain will probably play some important role in this context in the years to come. But independently of, of cryptocurrencies and, and public ledgers around property deeds, in terms of the supply chain, Blockchain is very much in its infancy. It's a, it's a new technology. EPCIS was published by GS1 over 10 years ago, now also published as an ISO standard, and we're seeing it in an increasing number of contexts, not only in the pharmaceutical supply chain, but, but spearheaded by the pharmaceutical supply chain as an enabler for visibility. Um, and, and, and it's by no means a magic wand or a panacea. It's it's part of the GS1 toolbox. So um, serialization itself is a pretty new and innovative concept in the sense that we haven't, there's not, not been that many years that we've been talking about identifying assets and products uniquely so that you know, suddenly the bottles of water on the tables here, and it's not just grouped by class that you can distinguish each of them uniquely and individually. 
you couple serialization with the concept of event-based visibility and and both of these together are really going to improve the 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 uh, the efficiency um, and 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 the accuracy of the supply chain. And EPCIS is one of the tools in GS1's toolbox that will help you do this. EPCIS is a visibility enabler. What's visibility? So you can break this down into as many or as few subtopics as you like. It's basically it's these five. So visibility is is tracking where are my products or assets anywhere in the supply chain right now. It's tracing where what is the path my my products have taken. So working basically in a table in chronological order, which is, is each of the stops that my my product or asset has taken to get to where it is now. Um, chain of custody or chain of ownership, also sometimes referred to as pedigree or provenance. Where is where does this come from? And in plain English, who has touched my stuff? Who has been in contact with my products or assets along the way? Inventory management, and this this means not only being able to say how many units of product X Y Z do we have on hand um, on the in the hospital right now. It's how many of do who do we have on hand and how many of them are still going to be usable three months from now? How many of them are expiring next week? Inventory management. And last but not least, recall, if there's a quality control problem, finding unique identified objects scattered across the supply chain downstream, finding them, initiating a recall action and following the reverse logistics back up the supply chain. These are the aspects of supply chain visibility. And EPCIS enables this by answering four key questions at each important station on the supply chain. What objects are at the focus of the event? And you can do this, you can do this based on a grouping, based on lot batch level, um, but that will only take you so far. So ideally, for identifying your products with a GTIN and a serial number, and this, this GTIN and serial number or an EPCIS parlance SGTIN, serialized GTIN, as at the focus of the event. It could be an SS unique identifiers. When has this event happened? So the date, the time, and the time zone, so you can chart this in some kind of a chronology. Where has this happened? So where was this event recorded, and what are the whereabouts of these objects immediately subsequent to the event? And last but not least, and this is an important one, it's the adding the business context to it. Why have I gone through the trouble of capturing this information? I'm not doing this to create a huge mass of big data. It's, it, I'm linking this capture of data to some important process step in the supply chain. What, when, where, and why? Please remember these four aspects, these four dimensions, you're going to be quizzed on your way out of the room. Nobody gets dinner tonight if you can't answer these four questions. How do you leverage EPCIS to create this picture? Well, in addition to some of our more technical specifications, we've also published an implementation guideline for EPCIS, which kind of bridges the gap between the technical world and the business world and puts EPCIS in a tangible kind of a business context for business users. And one of the chapters, I think it's chapter four off the top of my head, we have a, a methodology for laying out a visibility system, how you would design a visibility system based on EPCIS. And if a company has never done this before, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to call together two groups of individuals who maybe have never worked together with each other in their lives. It's going to be the people at the operations level, at the bottom, the people in the plant, the people at the distribution center, at the dock door. And it's another group of people, it's the people at the enterprise level, the business users, the people, the IT architects. And these are people that are going to be brought together maybe for the first time and they're going to learn a lot about what each, each other does and they're probably going to be surprised by a lot of the topics which come up. And they're going to get together and they're going to lay out some kind of a, some kind of a table, some kind of a chart. It might look like this and you'll generally have, you'll have a horizontal axis with chronology and places and you'll have a vertical axis along which it may be helpful to do your logistical hierarchy. And they'll go through and they'll see each point in their supply chain where a business process is taking place. And they're gonna lay that out to start with. And this is what, this is what our supply chain looks like 
and this is just an internal perspective. This is the factory in the company zone DC. And probably both sets of these people are going to find out something about, about each other that they never knew before. Enterprise and the, the business users are going to find out about how things are really done at operations level. They say, wow, we never knew that you did it this way. And the operations people, the people that are running the serialization lines in the facilities, the people that are in charge of getting the pallets together and sending them out the door, they say, well, we never knew that the business users needed this kind of information. So they're going to lay this all out, and but they don't want to do this for the sake of amassing big data. So then they're going to go through and see which of these process steps is really relevant to the business problem at hand. What are we trying to solve? What are we trying to make more efficient? What are we trying to make safer? And so they're going to go through, and for each of these steps that's relevant, they're going to, they're going to single these out as an individual visibility event. Beginning here with the commissioning of a given item on through, and some of these, some of these steps may not be relevant for the operation. We see here that an item is commissioned, it's packed into a case, um, then we have a commissioning of a pallet with an SSCC, it gets put in a container and it gets shipped out in a truck, and this the shipment with the truck might not be relevant in this case, so it's, it's not recorded as a visibility event. And when the pallet is received at the, at the DC, this is important for the supply chain visibility in this context, so that's assigned a visibility event. So this is decided upon in this, in this team meeting. And, and each completion of each of these steps is modeled as an event. Once they've decided which of these events are important, they can go and decide, okay, what data do I need to include? What information needs to play a role in these visibility events? And, and this is really important because this entire setup needs to be driven by the parties consuming this information, the business users. This is not about how or what is being captured. We're talk today we're talking about data matrix. Maybe in 20 years we'll be talking about RFID. It doesn't matter. What matters is what information is required at the back end. What information does the enterprise, the enterprise level require? And when this question, these questions are answered and then this information is, is agreed upon, then you're in a position to set up what's called a visibility data matrix. This is not to be confused with two-dimensional data matrix. It's a different kind of matrix. And that is really important because this will help you make some of the most critical design decisions in setting up your visibility system. Why is it important? Because this, this functions as the kind of the hinge between these two worlds. This is the hinge between the operations and data capture part of the operation at the, at the low level, and the enterprise and IT part of the operation, the business users at the top level. This is the hinge that brings everything together. And if you set this up right, this will allow you down the line to make any changes you need. It'll also determine the kind of master data you need, and it'll allow you to drive this through governance. You see here, this is a simplified version, but we see our what, when, where, and why. So beginning with the commissioning, the commissioning is the beginning of a product life cycle. It's when you marry one object with a unique identifier. You introduce it into the supply chain. So we see here that a G10 serial number, as I said, an SG10, a serialized G10, is established, introduced to the supply chain on the 9th of May, 2018, at 12.35 East African time. This is happening on packaging line 47. We're recording this because this is being commissioned. And we go all the way down the line, and this is an abbreviated version of this, but we see that this product is leaving, this product is leaving the facility. It's being shipped in conjunction with its SSCC. And here in the middle, we have the interesting case for visibility events three and five. We see that for visibility event three, items are being packed into the case. So you've got the, the SG tins of the items and the SG tin of the case. And a little bit later, these cases are packed into a tote or onto a pallet. And then you've got the SSCC of the pallet and the SG tins of the individual cases as well. And these two events are important because these are good examples of what we call aggregation. I think aggregation is often mentioned, but it's frequently misunderstood. Aggregation is the creation of a parent-child logistic relationship between the containing object and one or more objects being contained. And it's extremely powerful in all supply chain contexts, 
not least of which is a pharmaceutical traceability context, not least of which because it enables the practice of inference. And this goes in both directions, and this can be nested as much or as little as you like. So you see here at the top, we have an aggregation being created in two stages. At secondary packaging level, two items are being loaded into a case, and this case is further being aggregated to the logistics level, to a pallet. At some point, this is sent out, this leaves the factory at the DC, it arrives at the recipient, and the same thing happens in reverse. And we had earlier today, or yesterday, I've lost track, but there was one of the speakers brought up the issue that, um, and I think Francois mentioned yesterday that if you, once you take, take things out of the aggregation, you rip open a case, you start taking articles out, you take one article out, the, the logistic unit ceases to exist. The SSCC is no longer valid at that point. And that's what's happening here. You have the cases being taken off the pallet and the cases are being opened up and these aggregations are being disaggregated. It's the dissolution of these relationships. I've only scratched the surface, but we still have a lot to cover. I would like to leave you with a few learnings um, from practice. And, and I started by mentioning that this is not just about EPCIS. EPCIS is one of the powerful tools in GS1's toolbox. We're really talking about serialization and, and event-based visibility in the supply chain. And in terms of serialization, this, the complexity of this cannot be underestimated, both in terms of the cost involved and the timing involved. Um, we regularly present at conferences, and these things are discussed in a European context, the rule of thumb. Um, and I think this is North American context as well. Starting a serialization on a line that is not yet serialized, rough, rough estimate value is 18 months from start to finish, from, from beginning the project through implementation, piloting, until that object, that, that line is ready to go live, 18 months. The complexity the cost limited to what it costs to roll this out on the line or to install the hardware on the line. It's, it impacts so many things in the back end. And if a company does not have its house in order, um, you, can, you can roll out EPCIS until the cows come home. It's going to be a case of junk data in, junk data out. This means um, it's really important not to underestimate the complexity. It's important not to underestimate the timelines. It's important to communicate with as many stakeholders as possible, both internally and externally. I talked about this meeting of the two worlds and about bringing the enterprise people together with the operations people, really important. But this is also the external stakeholders, and that means not only your trading partners, it means the regulators. It's happened in, once in a while it happens that the regulators in a given regulatory jurisdiction will come up with deadlines which make you wonder how they came up with the deadlines. The more the regulators are kept in the loop on the complexity around this and they see the efforts that are being made towards rolling out the standard and towards rolling out compliance with the regulations, the more they'll be in tune to, wow, this, this really takes a lot longer and more thought and more complexity than what we required. Last but not least, it's really important to use standards because all of the things that I talked about in the past 15 minutes and the surface that I scratched today, the whole point of this, doing this based on GS1 standards, on ISO GS1 standards, open standards, is to make sure that you're interoperable across the supply chain internally with your trading partners now and 10 years out. And it means it protects you from vendor lock-in. And it means that you can leverage the learnings from a, in one regulatory jurisdiction today and, and leverage it and roll it out in a completely different regulatory jurisdiction down the road. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it on. Um, I think we'll have time for questions and answers at the, at the end of the session. And if we don't get to that today, you can try to ambush me tonight. There's no guarantee my voice will be there, but our contact details are at the end. So. Don't be bashful about contacting us by mail or or, uh, or by phone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. Um, it's me again. Um, don't feel to get into a time loop. You will remember some of the, uh, the slides, but I have uh, uh, some different. I'm representing the, um, the pharma business. I own the um, 
uh, civilization traceability program uh, on the pharma level. Cindy Pütger, whom most of you know in the other room, uh, is more or less my, my matrix boss because she owns that from, from a corporate level. So again, here, we're focusing on the emerging markets. Um, and then to the map, I switched in the earlier presentation quite quickly through, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of an update about our network. It's not that messy as the one of, of Pascal. The, the amount of sites they have is easy, so I'm still good on that side. Uh, even even from the, the third party manufacturers, I have just 350, you have 1,200 or so or 1500 so it's it's even worse with uh, with uh, with Pfizer than we have a manufacturing site in Mexico one in Brazil two in Colombia one in Peru eight in Argentina we have uh, third party manufacturers in Egypt and Saudi and in Turkey we have three sites in Russia. We have one site in Pakistan, two sites in India building a third site. We acquired a business recently in Vietnam with what, whoever I'm asked, two to six sites. I have one in Indonesia and I have one in China. And Francois is already... <laughs> So that's, that's my challenge. Uh, and it's in all, all of those countries, most of those countries. Um, we do have active regulations draft uh, appearing. And from that perspective, we have now already a lot of experience in, in doing the implementation. Therefore, I want to share a little bit more on, on that part, really seeing how the, the master data piece as well as the reporting piece, uh, Pete and Craig talked about, uh, are really f uh, falling into this. So uh, going back to that picture, uh, one of the things uh, where we said, okay, if we do it as sequential, how we would do the implementation, we always looked into, can we not have also from ourselves a global standard? Can I just go to one of the suppliers and just say, you know, I have 200 packaging lines, make me a price. It's not working like that. Because on the different sites and different levels, as I already earlier said, we do not have always the automation piece. We do have a lot of manual packaging uh, in our sites in Indonesia, in India, and in Pakistan. I even cannot calculate the ROI for a case packer, if I install that in Pakistan, where I can put camera systems on, on this, I can have multi-layers for aggregation, compared to the cost of an operator for the hand packing. It's just not working. I would ru financially ruin my business in Pakistan. That's what I'm just recently being accused to, uh, just being too expensive for that. A different story. Um, so if we want to do this, we cannot do this really uh, with one supplier in that sense, because A, I have different standards in my, my so manufacturing, standards in my network. B, not everybody has also the support network on the countries. Back to my famous Pakistan. The last visit uh, to Pakistan from my side need, needed to be canceled but because I did not get my visa on time. So if I have that challenge and I have nobody locally in that support, how I can do this? And if I don't have it right on my manufacturing sites, how I can do this with similar equipment also down my supply chain, in my central supply chain warehouses, in my affiliate warehouses and regional distribution centers. So from the implementation perspective, the one thing is the theory. The other thing is, you know, it needs to run. And as I said earlier, it's massive data, it's massive checks. As Chuck said earlier, you know, scanning needs to be done in, in all kind of con conditions every second. Zero mistake. So from that perspective, it's, it's really for us important that we go through that evaluation um, uh, over time that we are able also to set our uh, sites into this. Um, 
from that perspective, I shared again what it does mean from a data, but also it's for us very much important to really understand um, if I go for the different systems level, and I go now back a little bit on the operations IT side, the different levels, one, two, three, four, five. Five is enterprise in that sense, and that's where we do the reporting into it. We use a platform which is combined level four and level five. Um, and um, I get always fights um, from uh, our different um, local organization and pushbacks. And I just say, you know, we have that local supplier. He can do this cheap based on our costing model. That's true. But if you want to export, and you do have different legislations, different requirements in different countries. I cannot do this with a local system because I'm stuck in the first time when I export into a different country. And especially for our site in Pakistan, we have long, long discussions around this because it will be one of our launch sites for exploring our business into Africa. So if I want to do this, and I have different standards in Pakistan and different applications which are running this, I cannot do the reporting in the future here to Ethiopia or to Tanzania to any other countries because you know, we're still fighting with legislations in Pakistan and what should be coded and what should not be coded. Um, so that is very much important. That is the main trigger for us, and that's why we so much focus on standardization because it makes our life difficult. And I'm not talking now about um, what we have to do for Europe or for the US, uh, where we have all the high margin. It is where the medicines are, are really covering basic needs of humanity in Africa and in Asia. So the more standardization you put into, the, the, the easier it's from a cost model perspective for everybody to still be able to supply medicines to the patients. Um, going now for the, the integration, Ulrike said that her lovely model is always Turkey. And uh, yes, it was in stages, it's very, very well designed. Serialization started in 2009 and then reporting in 2012 and, and really went into this and they see the benefits, which I will talk later on as well. Um, it was really well designed from the beginning. I think everybody can admit this. Um, it had a very efficient civilization model, um, and it was really just designed for the reimbursement fraud. But it made so much more out of it, and so much more benefit came back to, to the government, which is really good. But the first weeks were really hard. I, you know, Pascal, Francoise, I think for you it was the same. We, we had a side discussion earlier. Um, everything went well, but there was a master data issue on the GLN locations. And um, returns ended up in a complete mess. We had stock all over the place. Uh, we were not able any longer to receive material or to ship material because nobody knew, you know, what happened. And that, that was the moment when um, I inherited uh, uh, civilization uh, within Pharma uh, because my boss at that time uh, came to me and said, it has to do a little bit with IT and a little bit of processes. That's your shop. Fix it. So... That, that, that is how our stories are beginning. China, another one. Um, first of all, China, and I go back now quickly. On the right-hand side in the middle, uh, that's the Chinese code. That's the linear barcode, which is not uh, GS1 compliant, and which is really a pain for us. We even have to pre-print with packaging material suppliers the codes because we cannot print it at our lines. So that's really an issue. So that's why I'm more than, than happy that uh, we now have the, um, the initiative to go for pilots for GS1 codes for China. 
Um, everything was also there, there, there well designed from the beginning, uh, as expect the coding by itself, which is an uh, issue. And um, the whole complexity was also completely not well thought of by the, by the governments. There was uh, issues with receiving the CLIs numbers. They, as I said earlier, the government um, gave it to a company who provided us the data. So we downloaded the, the data, then we have to give it back to our packaging suppliers. They printed it on, they checked it, we, we uh, put it back, we checked it when, when we made the manufacturing, or we gave it to our third party manufacturers who checked that. And it was really, really complex. And the whole ins and outs and the whole uh, shipping point design was too much also in country. So uh, at this moment of time, we are still obliged. No, it's paused that we have to uh, record shipping events in China, but we are still being, um, uh, have to be compliant and printing on codes, which doesn't make sense, but okay, it is like uh, as it is. Um, the, the whole handling of the non standard codes is really costing quite a lot of money uh, for us from an, from a an handling perspective. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, keep it simple. If you move forward, go for the standards that saves uh, a lot of uh, uh, money in that. And then finally, Pakistan. Um, there was a lot of discussion in Pakistan about the, the legislation. Uh, we, from an Abbott side, we are a relatively big player there. We were uh, very much involved with the uh, 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 regulatory authority there. And we went back and forth all over the, the, the place. And one moment of time was like, boom, that's it. July 14th, in six months, everybody has to do dynamic coding. And by the way, one and a half years later, you do serialization, and a year later, you do primary and aggregation. Uh, so, yep, good luck. No, but we, we are now on the way to, to develop hybrid solutions uh, in our sites. We try to decouple printing of the, um, of the card boxes in our sites ourselves. Uh, because we do hand packing, as long as we can can do this with the two D coding, we have not full a solution yet. Uh, if we have serialization and also especially for aggregation, and we are fighting like lines to get the primary serialization out of the way, because we have not a solution yet for it. Um, that's really one thing. The other thing is that also additional information needed to be printed and encoded on the, uh, in the 2D uh, data matrix code, which are not according to GS1 standards. The so-called AI240 application identifier would, uh, and, uh, and identifies the drug code in the national drug code system. God damn, you have the G10, take this one and make the link in your system. But these are the things where, you know, we, we made the emphasis about the master data and the simplification also in the G, uh, G, GDSN to really ensure that little data needs to be linked and the rest we have to keep in our other systems. <clears throat> so the challenges are, are still the same. Um, it, it is... Um, it is depending on the level uh, of the sites we have. Um, we have smooth implement implementation. We have also difficult implementation. Uh, we always try to prevent and prevent to go into a site two or three times uh, because it's just uh, too expensive in that sense. Um, also, the whole infrastructure which we have to put in place the local servers where we can collect the data buffer from the packaging lines before we send that to our enterprise reporting system. In those countries uh, in Asia and, and in Middle East and partly also in Latin America, 
I would not say we have a very stable electric power system. So we have to cover power outages as, as well in that sense uh, that we can buffer, just buffer the data. Okay, the packaging line will stop, but you know we cannot lose the data because otherwise we have to scan the data again. Um, so that, that needs to be done. Uh, quite complex in, in that sense. And that's my more or less last slide and my favorite one. Um, uh, and it's not to read for you at this moment of time. I really apologize for, for this, but I do see the benefit of serialization beyond compliance for us also as manufacturers, not only for the donors, not only for the regulators. Also on our side, we have a lot of what we can do, a lot of what we invent, um, especially in our world where 80 to 90% of our sales are out of pocket. It's not due to health insurance systems where we have been living in, in the US and in Europe for years. It's really the individual patient is paying to it. So I have the possibility if I find a way that I can deliver an app to the patient that the patient by, its, by him or herself can check, okay, this is an uh, authenticated Abbott product with, through a secure supply chain. Then I can be in contact with the patient and then the patient can also be very, very secure that he gets a high quality Abbott product through a very secure supply chain. And that's what we are striving for. Are we there? No. Will we be there tomorrow? No. Also not in six months, but we are working on this. Uh, and this is part of um, our promise, which we want to give. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Pete. I think you feared that I escaped. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, uh, maybe first, most of the people have seen me yesterday. Okay, so I'm not going to redo the story who I am. But again, uh, first I want to tell you I feel very humble uh, after the presentation of Ulf and also what he mentioned about Pascal, because I thought in Johnson & Johnson we were dealing with a, a very complex uh, environment. I explained that yesterday. Now, if I hear that you have a couple of thousand external manufacturers, I feel really humble. And my life is easy, I think. Although I don't feel really like my life is easy. And you've seen in the first presentation the guy with his hands who was drowning. I think that was me sometimes. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be fast. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, yeah, our way of integrating systems and integrating uh, processes to, to, to handle this, this new thing, which is called traceability. Uh, I'm going to also explain um, which standards we use. And we have standards in our uh, company. Um, they are not always applicable, however, but we have standards. And then I'm going to talk about patchwork, uh, 